Investors have always looked outside the United States for opportunities, but these days they're looking further afield than ever. Previously untapped markets in Southeast Asia, Latin America, the Middle East and Africa are now easily accessible through ETFs and other trading vehicles. But with great opportunity comes great risk. This week on Money and Markets will help you navigate the next generation of emerging economies. A roundtable of guests will look beyond the traditional developing markets and tell you why CIVITS is now an acronym you need to know. Plus, we'll get specific which sectors and stocks within those countries are ready to explode and which should you avoid. And we'll take a closer look at China, once an emerging economy, now the dominant force in the Eastern Hemisphere. What does the future hold for its economic prospects? And what does that mean for consumers and investors here in the U.S.? All that and a final comment from Martin Weiss right now on Money and Markets. From our studios in Jupiter, Florida, Weiss Money Network presents Money and Markets. And now, Jamie Holmes. Hello, everyone. When we refer to the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, the term emerging markets, well, it may already be dated. So for our roundtable on emerging markets, we're looking beyond the BRICs and helping you find investment opportunities off the beaten path. Joining us on set today is Rudy Martin. He's the publisher of the Latin Stock Investing Newsletter. Tony Sagami is an expert on Asian stocks at Weiss Research. He's joining us from Seattle. And from Bangkok, Thailand, Larry Edelson, a financial analyst for Weiss Research, specializing in international macroeconomics. Rudy, I, I want to start with you. Where are you seeing opportunities outside of the BRIC nations, not just in Latin America, but the rest of the world? Yes, I do see a lot of opportunities uh, in the uh, region, uh, in uh, emerging economies. But before you consider um, other areas. You need to consider the impact of Brazil on the region. Brazil dominates Latin America in much the same way that China dominates Asia. Okay, I think that's a good point. Larry, you agree then with Rudy that these regions are going to be dominated by their bigger economies and specifically, like, like Rudy said, in Asia, it's going to be dominated by China. Yeah, absolutely, uh, Jamie. China, you know, is about to pass Japan as the world's second largest economy, putting it right behind the United States. So, of course, it exerts a huge pull on the rest of the region. It's fair to say that as China goes, so goes Asia. Uh, and recently, China's economy has been incredibly strong. So that translates into huge growth and investment opportunities throughout the region. Tony, what are you seeing in these emerging Asian economies, specifically the ones outside of China? Oh, you know, I agree. There are tremendous investment opportunities in markets all over Asia. One of the things I look at the most is shipping because I think that's a great indicator of economic health. And one of the gauges that I look at is global cargo shipments. The International Air Transportation Association reports that they're up 18.5% this year. And that's just over the first six months. But most of that growth is coming from Asia. According to the air cargo world, a full 45% of all global air freight either originates or is shipped from Asia. And it's just not China we're talking about where we're seeing these impressive economic numbers. Uh, Singapore's exports jumped by 53% in June, 53%. What's even more impressive about that number is that 80% of it, of those exports, went to other Asian countries and only 20% to North America and Europe. Larry, from a macroeconomic standpoint, what do people need to understand about Asia when they're looking for investment opportunities there? Well, I think one of the most important things uh, right now, Jamie, is People need to understand the effect of politics and, and geopolitical tension on the economies of Asian countries. Is It's often overstated by the Western media. In Thailand, for instance, where I live now, we recently experienced a civil war here. But stocks here barely took a hit, and stocks are up more than 30% in Thailand over the past year. In China last year, you know, uh, we hear a lot in the Western press about some 60,000 protests. But what's not being reported in the Western press is only about 2% of them were directed at the government's economic policies. 98% of them were about environmental situations. So when you hear about political unrest as a threat to Asian economic growth or your investments in those countries, you have to look at it twice. I think it's a fundamental misunderstanding of the Asian culture. Uh, Asian people have a long tradition of following their leaders and they continue to have confidence in them. 
So investors shouldn't worry uh, as much about political factors when weighing in whether or not to buy Asian stocks, in my opinion. Rudy, which sectors of these emerging op uh, economies are you seeing the most opportunity? Well, the obvious choice is commodities. You know, there have been a lot of investors who have made money by investing in material stocks. But beyond the material stocks and the commodities, I look at two sectors, infrastructure and telecom. And what I'm referring to in infrastructure is, uh, if you take a look at the uh, Brazilian infrastructure fund and look at the composition there, you'll see independent power producers, uh, logistics companies, companies that you couldn't normally invest in that are really probably best invested in through an ETF structure. By the way, there's a Chinese version of that, and that's up 15% just in the last uh, three months. In addition to infrastructure, I also like the opportunities in telecom, not just in the region, but in all emerging economies. Recently in the news, you had the battle for control of a Brazilian company, and the key there was Brazilian subscriber growth in the wireless era is going over 20% a year, and that's a very rare thing that, uh, in terms of, of growth to actually see that. And uh, for that reason, Telefonica and Portugal Telecom uh, were most interested in buying out uh, Brazilian uh, uh, companies and I th telecom companies. And I think there are going to be some opportunities in other emerging economies. Larry, we're, we're talking economics here, of course, and of course that means uh, a lot of acronyms. The one getting a lot of attention from investors lately is CIVITS. I, I know you know this. It refers to Colombia, Indonesia, Vietnam, Egypt, Turkey, and South Africa, markets where investors are finding a lot of new opportunities. Let's focus on the Asian countries on that list. What are you seeing in the Vietnamese and the Indonesian markets? Well, Vietnam is, is just now becoming a viable market for American investors. The easiest way to invest in Vietnam right now is through ETFs and mutual funds rather than individual stocks. The largest exchange traded fund uh, for investors on Vietnam is the Market Vectors Vietnam ETF, symbol VNM. I see Indonesia also as a great opportunity, much like uh, Canada was 100 years ago. Indonesia has vast natural resources, copper, oil, palm oil, cement, natural gas, and uh, it's just now starting to develop, uh, truly develop the infrastructure to exploit those natural resources on a big scale. Tony, what's your take here? Indonesia and Vietnam, your thoughts? Well, Indonesia is experiencing some, some huge growth. Its economy grew by 5.8% in the first six months, and for the full year, it should be about 6%. Now, I'll give you an example. Indonesia's state-owned shipping port is so optimistic about its economy that it expects cargo container traffic to increase more than 100% over the next decade. And it's planning an expansion that will make it the biggest port in the world, even bigger than the Port of Los Angeles. You know, that prosperity is being reflected in the in Indonesian stock market, too. And it's now sitting at an all-time high. Can you think of any North American or European stock market can that make anywhere near a similar claim? Nope. And let's skip over to Vietnam. Now, Vietnam stock market has been moving in the opposite direction since hitting a record in March of 2007. It's moving more now in tandem with the Chinese stock market. But the Vietnamese economy grew by more than 6% in the second quarter, and its per capita income is up nearly five-fold higher than it was in the mid-1990s. You know, that new wealth is showing up in gold purchases, too. According to the World Gold Council, net retail gold investment in Vietnam topped 500,000 ounces in the first quarter. That's a 36% year-over-year increase. All right, Rudy, we're going around the world again. Turkey, the letter T there in civets. What opportunities are you seeing in Turkey? Before I go making an assumption about our country, I look at three factors when I consider uh, investing in, the, in a region. Uh, and the first is the uh, income trends, the second are population, and the final are uh, national uh, ratings trends. And in the case of Turkey, these are all positives. Now, first, it's important to, as I say, follow the money. According to Forbes magazine, there are 28 billionaires residing in Istanbul. That tells me that there's a lot of high net worth individuals there making money off the market. You know, you'd have to, it rank, Turkey ranks fourth in the world behind New York, Moscow, and London in terms of uh, you know, the top billionaires. But that wealth isn't just at the top levels. If you look at the Istanbul stock market, that was the second hot, hottest market last year after Argentina, one of my favorite markets. Um, that Istanbul market basically doubled last year. And so uh, from an from a income trend and a performance trend, there's, there's an opportunity there. Second, I look at uh, the labor force. Uh, the average age of the Turkish population is under 28 years old. That's a dynamic, vibrant uh, workforce with falling unemployment rates. 
And finally, I consider the sovereign date that now rating agencies don't always get it right, and, uh, but it's nice to get concurrent confirmation. And in the case of Moody's and Fitch, we had two rating agencies last year both upgrade Turkey, and a very rare thing happened. Fitch actually upgraded it two notches, so I see a rare investment opportunity for investors looking at uh, putting money into Turkish stocks. Okay, Larry, back to you again. The last letter of CIVIT stands for South Africa. What's your take on that economy? Well, Rudy mentioned that Brazil dominates the Latin American economies, and of course we all know China dominates the Asian economies. South Africa, in much the same way, dominates uh, Africa. Uh, and in relation to the other sub-Saharan African economies, uh, South Africa, all of Africa for that matter, is already a huge producer of natural resources not just gold and diamonds, but also platinum, copper, coal, oil, many rare earth metals. Uh, that production is just going to increase in the future as, as the global appetite for natural resources continues to grow. And South Africa now ha also has a robust stock market. But you know, going back to the theme of Chinese economic dominance throughout Asia, uh, we have to remember you know, South Africa is becoming heavily dependent on China. And as China goes, China's picking up the boots for South Africa. Okay, Larry, hey, thanks for being here. We appreciate it. Thank you, Jamie. We're going to delve deeper into another civics country, and that's Colombia. That's going to be with Rudy Martin right after the break. A bit later, we're going to bring Tony Sagami back for a discussion of China's economic future and why it's so important to investors here in the U.S. Also, be sure to stay tuned for a closing commentary from Martin Weiss. First, though, we want to hear from you. If you have questions for any of this week's guests or suggestions for topics that you'd like us to cover, just email us at weissmoneynetwork at weissinc.com. Money and Markets will be right back. America is in trouble. Federal and local governments owe over $123 trillion. New debt is escalating at the rate of $183 million per hour. That's $1.6 trillion per year. Bond prices are plunging, and that could drive interest rates sky high, triggering an even deeper recession. If you are worried, and you should be, download Mike Larson's blockbuster new report with urgent investment recommendations to help you protect your wealth and profit. Don't delay. Do it now. Hello everyone, we are back on Money and Markets with Rudy Martin. He is the publisher of the Latin Stock Investing Newsletter. He has been searching the globe for picks and pans in the civets countries. Rudy, let's talk a little bit about Colombia now. Which stocks are you seeing there in that market? Thank, Jamie, thank you. When you're talking about Latin America in general, you're talking about natural resources. Uh, it's the most d developed sector in the uh, local economies. And uh, so my first pick would be Ecopetrol, Colombia's uh, national oil company. That has an ADR on the New York Stock Exchange that trades on the ticker symbol EC. And the stock has more than doubled in price in the last 18 months or so. So I think it has really good momentum going forward and a nice yield. Now, earlier this month, is an important development. Ecopetrol uh, bought back BP's Colombian oil and gas operations. But it also has operations in Brazil, Peru, and the United States. And I think with its capital position and these new operations, there's room for further growth. Rudy, what about companies and industries outside of natural resources? Well, you know, when I think of opportunities uh, in the region, I also think of consumer uh, the sector and also specifically the banking sector. One of the hottest little Latin stocks over the last year and a half has been Bank Colombia. Since March of 2009, it's gone from about $16 per share to about 60 wow. and I think it still has more upside potential. Bank Colombia's profits have been well above average. The company has uh, an increasing dividend. And what's important for a financial company, CIB has solid liquidity with an unusual strong capital position. So I think it will continue to boost its penetration in this local market by growing personal and uh, business loans, as well as commercial loans in the areas that I mentioned I like, which are energy, infrastructure, and specific to Colombia, healthcare and financial services. Rudy, uh, earlier you were talking about how much you like the Turkish market. What stocks do you see there you'd recommend? Well, yeah, I mentioned the telecom sector earlier. And that's a growing industry, not just in Latin America, but in the Middle East as well. 
And uh, so my number one pick in Turkey will be a company called Turkcell. It trades on the New York Stock Exchange under the ticker symbol T.